Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 133 of TGIK. I'm Josh. I am really excited to be back hosting a TGIK with y'all. And we have a really, really cool topic this week that I've been just trying my hardest to not dive into because I figured it would probably make a really good, a really good episode. So for those who might be joining us for the first time, TGIK is a weekly show that we do on Fridays, 1 p.m. Pacific time. I know we got a lot of regulars in the room, but if you're new, we typically go over some of the stuff that's happening in the cloud native ecosystem. And we usually dive into some topic, you know, may it be a tool or, you know, some concept. Sometimes we're somewhat experts or at least somewhat competent in the tool we're using. And then sometimes it's things like today where we haven't really touched it. And together, we're going to all go through the process of playing around and, and sort of learning how it works. So again, my name is Josh. Really excited to be with you all today. Um, if you're joining us and you, and you want to, feel free to say hey in chat. It's a bit of a tradition to also say where you're tuning in from if you feel comfortable mentioning that. Uh, the notes for this episode, which I'll be going through, you can find on tgik.io forward slash live. So if you want to check out the notes we've got, feel free to check those out too. And let's see who we've got joining us today. Maddie, as always, um, we love having you. Thanks for joining us. Haim from Israel, welcome. Riv, we've got Riv from Boston. Welcome. Uh, Adrian, also from the eastern side, it looks like, in Toronto. Um, Adrian is one of the maintainers of uh, HNC, uh, or the hierarchical namespaces controller that we'll be talking about today. So say hey to Adrian in the chat. We will uh, we'll be leveraging some of his awesome knowledge as we <laughs> try to learn this thing. Bojanche, um, hello, hello, welcome. Martin, glad to have you back as always, Martin. Raiko, welcome, Raiko. Glad to have you. David. Hey, David, how's it going? We got Yuka from Helsinki. Awesome. Uh, we've got No coming in from the, the UK. Welcome. Um, Radha from Scott, uh, Scotland, uh, or Scottsdale, sorry, very different, uh, Scottsdale. Um, Jason, Jason's on my team at, uh, at VMware. Great, great to have you, Jason. Um, we've got Philip from Bonn. Rory, great to have you back as always. Rory from Scotland this time, not Scottsdale, but Scotland. Uh, Mona from Germany. We've got Choco, glad to have you. Welcome back. Tim, great to see you again, Tim. Oh, wow, we've got so many folks joining in. Welcome, everybody. We've got Paul. We've got Hash from Minnesota. Maz from Sudan. Welcome, Maz. Um, Alex, hey, Alex, great to have you. Alex is another teammate. Uh, the very familiar uh, Duffy um, under, the, under the moniker Malayan. Uh, Malian, and great to have you, Duffy. Thanks for joining us. I hope everything's going uh, going well with your time off. Hope you're uh, really decompressing a bit. Prethi from New Jersey. We got Michal, another from Scottsdale. Welcome, welcome. We got Vijay from Bangalore. Vijay, uh, Ajay from San Jose. Fully Geared Bear from Portugal. Martin, glad to have you back, Martin. Jordy from Boston. Victor from New York City. Um, we got Marco from Boulder. Oh, Jed. Hey, Jed. How's it going, Jed? Um, Jed is a, a former coworker, also a Boulderite. Glad to have you. All right, everyone. Looks like we got uh, an awesome crew here. So thanks for joining us. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about what we got going on in Kubernetes this week. So. As far as news goes, probably the most prevalent thing to the core is that for 120, there is a call for enhancements. So depending on how involved you are with Kubernetes upstream, um, there is this thing that gets worked on called KEPs, Kubernetes Enhancement Proposals. And there's some deadlines for getting those in and merged. Uh, if you're not that involved with Kubernetes, but are kind of curious about what's going on, this is actually a really cool page to check out. So if you go into the KEPs on GitHub, looks like this might be the template for making a new one, you can actually see all of the different special interest groups or SIGs represented inside of here. And you can kind of get a feel for what some of these different areas are working on. So if we look at, uh, let's see, what would be a good one? Um, SIG API machinery, SIG apps. Let's see what's going on with SIG node, maybe. Okay, 
So you can see some of the stuff that's coming in here for KEPs. Here, here's a good example. One I know we've talked about on TGIK a couple times. The KEP for sidecar containers or being able to put in uh, you know, extra containers along with your main container, but having them actually have this kind of specification of being a sidecar that can have a couple implications on how they work. So you can read the design. It's got a bunch of cool information. Usually these go really deep about the problems that are trying to solve, maybe a little bit around some implementation considerations. So again, in 120, there's some deadlines for the KEPs. If you're someone like me and just likes to browse them, um, keep in mind this KEP folder exists. It's in Kubernetes Enhancements KEPs, and you can check out all the good stuff that is going on. All right, cool. So that's it for the core this week. Um, oh, actually, you know what? There is, uh, there is one more thing I should mention. Uh, if you're eligible to vote for the steering committee, uh, please be sure to do so. So the steering committee, we've got a link in the notes if you're not familiar with what the steering committee does. But this is a group of, I believe, three people, and I believe the, the, the residency on the committee is, is two years. Hopefully I have my numbers right there. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, these are folks that are in charge of a lot of the direction of the Kubernetes project, a lot of the, the non-technical items around how the project proceeds, its governance, lots and lots of good stuff. And the folks that we have that are, uh, that are in, the, in the vote, let me see if I can pull up the, the names here. Um, do, do, do voting process candidate list is here. You'll notice a lot of these names. These are a bunch of pretty freaking awesome people, right? So um, if you're eligible to vote, do make sure you vote. There's a there's a link in the the in the uh, HackMD that talks a bit about it. The eligibility, I believe, is 50 contributions over the past year. Uh, if your involvement in Kubernetes is is pretty involved, but it just doesn't translate necessarily to like contributions in the more conventional Git sense. There is also a voter exemption form that you can roll with too. So, so do keep that in mind if you're kind of uh, more involved in some of the, the ancillary things that don't show up in the, same, in the same contribution mechanism. So really cool. Good luck to everybody who is, uh, who, is going for, uh, who is going for election on that steering committee. I'm sure based on the names we've got, whoever lands, it's gonna be a pretty freaking awesome committee. All right. Cool, cool. So in the ecosystem, what else do we have going on? Um, funny enough, I actually had, uh, I got to attend a meetup this week uh, from a person from Microsoft on the Open Service Mesh OSM. If you have not checked out OSM, OSM is a service mesh being implemented. The data plane, or I guess it is implemented, but it's being obviously advanced because it's pretty, pretty new. Uh, it is a, a service mesh based on uh, Envoy, so the data plane is Envoy in OSM. And what's probably the most unique to OSM that I'm aware of today, and I'm no OSM expert, is it is one of the first OSMs to be, or sorry, it's one of the first service meshes to be built from the ground up to comply with the SMI or the service mesh interface. So those in Cube, you know, we have things like CRI and CNI, and this enables us to kind of plug in different, different things um, into, into Kubernetes, like different container runtimes and so on. And the idea with SMI is if we define, you know, how we articulate or represent traffic policy and patterns and all kinds of things, then in theory, whether you're running Istio, whether you're running OSM, maybe whether you're running Linkerd, those can facilitate the same, the same stuff, the same kind of functionality uh, with their own implementation under the hood. But the reason they're in the news this week for us is they were accepted as a CNCF sandbox project. So that's really cool. One step towards um, having uh, some good governance around OSM. Congrats to the OSM team for getting into the sandbox. Pretty cool stuff. All right. And we've also got notes in a similar vein that CubeEdge was accepted as an incubating project in the CNCF landscape. CubeEdge, kind of like K3S, it, it, it attacks that edge slash IoT slash resource constrained uh, use case for Kubernetes that more and more folks are talking about and trying to solve. So congrats to the CubeEdge group. Um, they are now in as a incubating project. All right, Stackrocks had a report released about Kubernetes usage. Um, 
these numbers seemed really high to me. I'm not going to lie. Um, I, I haven't looked into how, how the data was collected, but if the numbers are actually this high, awesome. But the, the sentiment from the quick glance I gave is that um, in, in organizations that they polled at least or in groups of users they polled, 91% uh, reported having Kubernetes to orchestrate containers. Um, and, and that's awesome. It seems way higher than I would have ever guessed, but that's, <laughs> that's great. And then 75% of those in production, which again, maybe I'm just working with folks who aren't quite as far along, but that also seems high. Nonetheless, the great thing here is we know that um, Kubernetes is getting an insane amount of adoption. You know, it shows with TGIK, we all get excited to come together and check out the new tech. So regardless of how, how flawless this infographic is, um, Kubernetes is popular and that's a good thing for all of us. I think what was also interesting about this is that they kind of laid out what are some of the common ways that people run Kube. Um, obviously managed services are, or sorry, uh, managed services are kind of taking off if you kind of put them cumulatively. But uh, a large portion of folks are still on self-managed Kubernetes, which implies they are, you know, managing their own control plane and, and all that good stuff and not using a managed service like EKS or AKS. So that was, that was pretty interesting to me how some of these numbers fell through. Um, and then another thing that I, uh, I saw, which totally makes sense, is that security is one of those top concerns around container strategies. So um, if you've ever seen a TGIK with Duffy before, you've probably seen, and actually the one he did with Ian as well not too long ago, you've seen all the kind of sharp edges that can happen in a, in a vanilla Kubernetes cluster and how Kubernetes gives us the mechanisms, right, to turn the knobs and, and make it secure and add defense and depth at different layers. But it is definitely on us to make sure those knobs are turned in the right direction and actually, you know, helping facilitate what we need. So pretty, pretty interesting there. All right. So just taking another look at chat to see who else we have joining us. Hey, Waleed, great to have you as always. Um, very cool. Um, YMO, Yamo, uh, Ottawa, great to have you back, as always. Shaik, hello. Yeah, Paul, infographics never lie. Um, yeah, 100% of people run Kubernetes in production. That would, be, that would be a cool goal. We'll see how it goes. All right, good deal. So last news item that we've got is the Cloud Foundry Summit has been scheduled. I'm guessing this is a virtual event. Um, yeah, it's got a oh, virtual, it says it right there. But uh, for those who maybe aren't as familiar with Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry is a project that um, has kind of, I think, ridden side by side with Cube over the years and, and perhaps has been a bit confusing for folks. Like a lot of people think of these as, as kind of um, competitors. And in some ways you can think about it that way, but Cloud Foundry really brings like a kind of an application platform where something like Kubernetes is a bit more of an implementation detail. It's not necessarily something that folks are interacting with directly as much. All that aside, the Cloud Foundry Summit has some talks that relate to the cloud native landscape, um, Kubernetes stuff. Um, there's even a lot of work with Cloud Foundry going on around um, replatforming it on top of Kubernetes. So again, since Kube is more of an implementation detail for the project, there's talk about moving it onto that. You can see stuff about Prometheus. And you know, as this project deepens and Cube deepens, I think we're going to see more and more overlap between what we talk about on, uh, on Cloud Foundry and what we talk about on Cube. So if you want to check out these talks, feel free to, uh, to take a look at the this Cloud Foundry Europe schedule. Pretty cool stuff. All right. And Waleed, no, no, uh, no news about the uh, the new Forrester Wave uh, multi-cloud container development platform <laughs> infographic that I'm sure will be uh, will be coming soon. Don't don't have anything in this episode at least about it. All right, good, good. So that's it for the news. I think we had a bit of a light news week this week, at least things that we were aware of. So with that. Um, Let's go ahead. Yeah, if it's out, Walid, feel free to throw a link in the uh, HackMD. That'd be awesome. Let's, uh, the more infographics, the better, right? So yeah, throw, throw a link in there, Walid, if you can. Um, let's talk a little bit about the hierarchical, uh, hierarchical namespace controller, <laughs> which I will probably mispronounce a couple times. And like I said, uh, we're lucky enough to have Adrian here as maintainer of this project or one of the main uh, developers of this project, helping us out as we kind of go through and, and learn a little bit about it. So let's 
dive right in. And the first thing I thought we could do here, everyone, is maybe just kind of lay the foundation for like the problem space of this thing. And then we can start implementing it, getting into it, and, and playing around with it. All right. So what are, what are namespaces in Kubernetes, right? So this is one of the biggest things that I think a lot of us first get introduced into when we start with Kubernetes, and that is just the concept of a namespace, right? So we have a namespace. We know that there's a couple namespaces by default that we're super used to, right? One of those namespaces is cube system, namespace cube system, right? Where we expect, uh, well, I guess I could get pods or something more interesting than that, but the cube system namespace typically comes with every Kubernetes cluster and the default namespace is there as well. And then as we move along and we deploy things, we start adding namespaces and namespaces and namespaces, right? So as we kind of think about this evolution and as our clusters gain more and more adoption, right, we end up with all these namespaces. Now, real quick, everyone in chat, help, help me out here. What are the common things that you all deploy to namespaces, right? What are, what are the common things that you'll put in a namespace to like manage access or set up how network traffic could work and all that kind of stuff? What are, what are some of the common APIs or objects in Kubernetes you work with? So Duffy said resource constraints, right? Exactly. Let's put that one in first. So resource constraints here. We'll say resource quotas. We throw these into namespaces, right? And there's a ton in here. Yep, okay. Uh, app per namespace, right? Everything related to the app. So like secrets and stuff like that. Tim said network policy, exactly. So we do network policy in here. Yep, network policy, services, add-ons. Ingress, yep, ingress is another super common one that we throw inside of here. What about managing what people can access, like what um, what objects they can access and whether they can edit those objects? Yeah, RBAC, exactly. RBAC is a huge one that we're constantly putting into um, putting into these namespaces. And specifically with RBAC, right? We've got things like uh, we've got things like role bindings. All right. So we've got actually. Let me just copy these. It'll be a little bit easier. We've got role bindings. And we've got uh, roles that we put in here as well. And these are all namespace scoped objects that we oftentimes put in here. So role bindings, and we've got roles. There's even, uh, yeah, exactly. There's cluster bindings we can put in as well. Waleed said there might be service accounts that we put in that are specific to the namespace. So you get the point. There's a bunch of objects, right? And I've, I've missed some of them that you said, but those are all great examples. There's some objects that we commonly put inside of our namespaces in cube. And, and even if you think about like resource quota, there's resource quota, there's limit ranges, there's a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> there's, there's all these things. Now, what ends up happening in my experience when folks start getting deeper and deeper into Kubernetes and stuff gets adopted, they suddenly realize that they have these namespaces, right? Like they have the team A namespace, if you will, okay? And all of a sudden they realize, well, we're not just going to give a team a single namespace or for various reasons, it makes sense for team A to maybe have many, many namespaces, right? So we think about team A, um, you know, not saying that this is how you should lay out your names, your namespaces, but theoretically you could have namespace team A data layer, and then you could have namespace team A uh, front end layer. And there's, there's tons and tons of configura uh, considerations about how you lay these out, why you lay them out in certain ways. But suffice to say that at some point, we get to this idea where teams need multiple namespaces. And on top of that, you know, when team B comes around, they obviously might need their own set of namespaces. Now, when you think about these things, right, um, when you think about these things, you have a lot of them that are, uh, that are namespace scoped that you're going to actually uh, that you're going to actually want to have in kind of the sub namespaces, almost as like a, a rule of ownership, if you will. So think about some of these common ones. I'll get rid of some that might not make too much sense initially, and I'll stick to only namespace scope stuff here. So resource quota, network policy, role bindings, maybe roles, 
Um, service accounts could make sense, but let's let's keep it simple with something like this, right? And then what happens is when you instantiate Team A's database or uh, data namespace, you probably want some amount of these things to come along and kind of trickle into that, right? And what becomes challenging here is if you want teams to like be able to self-service and create their own namespaces or just have like a really easy mechanism that you can ensure when you create team A, team A data in this case, that you don't have to worry about these things um, having to be recreated like resource quota, network policy, role bindings, roles, and so on. And not to mention over time, you probably don't want these to drift significantly, right? So if you have network policy that is kind of scoped um, between the relationship here, you probably want to make sure that you don't necessarily have that kind of upper level network policy, right? Kind of like your baseline network policy to be mutated individually in some of these team namespaces. Now you might want to add more network policy. Again, you might want team, uh, specific namespaces to be able to you know, turn some knobs, but there's a decent chance you're going to want to have, um, you know, some kind of consistency in these resources that we're deploying, right? Now, historically, um, because the notion of a hierarchical namespace, which I think Adrian said higher up, um, loves hearing people say that word, right? It's, uh, it's definitely not the easiest for me to say. Uh, without these hierarchical namespaces or the concept of them, We've done a lot of different things uh, to, to work around this problem. One of the most common that I have seen is the idea of building some type of a, a namespace creator type operator or controller. So let's call this like the namespace creator, okay? Uh, creator, yeah. So. The idea with this pattern of something like a namespace creator is that rather than uh, rather than working with the namespace object itself, folks will come in here and they'll interact with the namespace creator, right? So they'll give some type of you know CRD. Let's say the CRD says something like uh, type uh, namespace uh, our namespace, right? It's a special company namespace. We'll just call it Acme namespace. How's that sound? Acme, right? And then they'll give some details in here and they'll say things like, um, okay, give me the, the name of the namespace, uh, team A, right? And then when this gets submitted to the namespace creator, this will then oftentimes do all the things to kind of put, in this case, it's more like defaults, if that makes sense, to basically translate this under the hood to something where we're actually creating of type namespace and along with the namespace that we're creating, we're also injecting some type of default, right? We're injecting things like the resource quota. Resource quota, okay? We're injecting things like a, a, a set of default network policies, perhaps. So network policy, right? And then, of course, our RBAC and all that good stuff. So I'll just you know, not call it by, well, we'll call it by its name. We'll say like role bindings here and just ignore roles for a second. And this will then get injected as part of that, that creation, right? Now this works, but there's definitely some different trade-offs to it, right? The first thing is that we still don't have like a sense of ownership per se. So we're not necessarily solving that exact problem yet. Another thing is that unless the namespace creator has the logic implemented, it might not actually help us with our skewing of things over time. Because if these are defaults that get injected at the time when a new namespace is created, if mutation happens at the network policy level when it shouldn't, there's no way to say for sure that it will stay or be reconciled to be back in line with the default we started with, right? So they're, they're quite different paradigms, like the notion of HNC in my mind at least, and the notion of a namespace creator. But this is just one of those patterns that we've kind of used to solve some of these common things. But in short, and then we'll get into HNC and check it out, in short, what, we're, what I think we're gonna be exploring today at least, unless HNC proves me wrong, is basically this idea that we can set up a hierarchy of namespaces, right? We could come in and we can create team A, we can have team A data, 
okay? And under this, there will be some amount of hierarchy and we'll actually be able to propagate objects between these different things based on the relationship. Um, so we'll say front end here. Okay, so that's what I'm really hoping to explore today and, and sort of see how this, how this works. All right, Steve Wade, glad to have you, Steve. Thanks so much for joining. All right, cool. Welcome, welcome. Okay, just checking chat out. Okay, good, good. All right. <laughs> So let's get a little bit into this idea of this idea of uh, hierarchical namespaces and see if we can get it deployed, see if we can get it running, all that good stuff. So what do we have to start off with today? Well, we have got a cluster um, provisioned by the lovely cluster API. Shout out cluster API team. And it has just some pretty typical stuff. Uh, let me make sure you're seeing my screen. Here's the cluster. It's got the vSphere CSI in it, because this one's running on vSphere, but if it was AWS, same story. Cube Proxy, Calico, Core DNS, pretty vanilla cluster. I haven't deployed much in it. And in this exercise, we're gonna try to make some amount of hierarchy here. So hoping that we can make this work. All right. Oh, I'm glad you two like the, like the diagrams. And after the episodes, I'll be sure to upload the diagrams to, uh, to GitHub as well. I know, uh, I know they're not the most professional looking diagrams, but at least we can kind of visualize stuff. So I'll be sure to, I'll be sure to upload those, no problem. Okay, so HNC. There are two links in the episode show notes if you haven't checked them out. Uh, one is a great blog. Is this blog written by you, by the way, Adrian? Yep, written by Adrian, who's in the chat today, talking a bit about the introduction of hierarchical namespaces. I bet Adrian talks about some of the things that we have covered as far as concepts here. I've done a quick scan of some of it, uh, but it does talk a bit about the idea of policy inheritance, right? The notion of having child and parent namespaces, and then this idea of delegation that we can set up. And these are all good things that we'll test out today. Now, the one, or I guess the two things that HNC comes with, right? The two things we know about is that to facilitate this model, HNC is gonna come with two things. One of them is gonna run in cluster, which going forward to not say the word hierarchy, I'm probably gonna say HN a bunch. HNC controller, which I guess C is part of the controller. So HNC controller, right? So this is the thing that's gonna run in cluster to hopefully facilitate this, this, type, of, this type of stuff we're talking about here. Now, what's really cool about HNC or uh, hierarchical namespaces, HN, is that there's also the, uh, the kubectl plugin. So we can run kubectl HNS and do a lot of the things to make these hierarchical namespaces exist and get the output and see their relationships and all that good stuff. Um, HNC is pronounced hunk, I like it. All right, hunk going forward. Um, we'll see if Adrian approves. <laughs> so. The, uh, the HNS plugin for kubectl is gonna give us a lot of the conventions. And I'm sure, I mean, Adrian can correct me if I'm wrong. I see no reason why we couldn't just go in and like do all this through CRDs and, and manually hook things up and wire them up. But I bet that the plugin is gonna make a lot of things convenient for us as we dive right in. So if you wanna check out the blog post by Adrian, be sure to check it out. The GitHub link is also here and that's where we're gonna start today. So let's get right into the GitHub page. So I'm going to shoot right over to releases. Um, let's see if I can find releases. I swear, since GitHub changed up their UI, I have the hardest freaking time finding anything inside of GitHub. Do you all have the same experience or is it just me? I feel like every single time I go to GitHub, let me see, I have the releases uh, bookmarked over here. I'll see if I can bring them up real quick. Um, HNC. Oh, you know why I'm not seeing releases? It's because I'm not on the main page. Come on, Josh. All right, here's the releases. See, I'm yelling at GitHub and it's user error. All right, HNC. So, uh, HNC has the cluster installation, so we'll check that out for sure. Um, and then this looks like the kubectl plugin. Okay. 
yeah, looks great. Let's try it. So we'll start off with the uh, let's start off with the controller. And here's what we'll do, everyone. In, in normal TGIK fashion, let's go ahead. I downloaded the code repo for HNC before this, and I made a, a repo called or a folder called manifest. So let's go ahead and grab some of these things and look at them before we apply, just to get a sense for what exactly we're grabbing here. So HNC version, manager, looking good. So let's W get this thing. Um, there we go. All right, lovely. So we've got the YAML there. And I'll tell you what, since we're still here and I'll forget and throw us off later, let's go ahead and get the uh, plugin started too. So I think I've still got the version uh, environment variable set. Yep, we're good there. HNC platform is definitely Linux AMD 64. I'm keeping the... Uh, the, the Linux on TGIK uh, train alive now that Duffy has, uh, now that we've lost a Linux user with, uh, <laughs> with Duffy. Um, so let's see here. Linux AMD 64, we'll curl in that HNS real quick. All right, good deal. So we've got that. Uh, this will put it there. You know what, let me switch to temp real quick and just uh, do that now. Okay, so kubectl HNS. I'll probably put this thing in my path and then after I put it in my path, it should be good to run as a plugin. So let's go ahead and try that. We will move this thing to cube, cuddle, HNS. We will put it in user local bin. And fingers crossed, looking good, okay. So it's there. Uh, I probably should have checked if it was executable. Let's see, cube, cuddle, HNS. Okay, I probably didn't make it executable. Cube cuddle HNS. All right. Yeah, WSL2 would be fair too. That it, I, I'm totally with you. In fact, I was at a uh, that meetup I was at. I guess actually it was probably because it was Microsoft people, but um, everyone was using WSL2 to give their demonstrations. I thought it was pretty freaking cool. Um, it's pretty awesome how... Uh, how much stuff Microsoft is doing with uh, with WSL. Um, okay, let's make that executable. Let's cube cuddle H. Hey, there we go. So uh, let's make my text a little bit smaller. We have got the cube cuddle HNS plugin manipulating hierarchical namespaces provided by HNC. All right. Oh, and Adrian said the crew integration for the plugin is coming soon. That will be very cool, Adrian. Um, prevent uh, jokers like me from messing up manually putting it in our path. So I, uh, I appreciate that. Um, oh no, Duff, you're watching this on a Mac. Have we already lost you? Have we already lost our, our Linux user, Duffy? I was joking with Duffy though. I think uh, he should bring a tiling window manager to, uh, to Mac operating systems. That'd be pretty cool. i3 is already branded like uh, an Apple product. It's got the i in front of it. So that could work out, right? Um, Okay, so soon is days, not weeks. Sounds good. All right, yeah, Steve says i3 for Mac, please. All right, we have got the plugin installed. Let's see if we can make this controller thingy work. So like I'd mentioned, I have a manifest directory. I put some resources in here that I knew were namespace scope that we'd probably wanna look at. Let's look at HNC Manager and see what we got going on here. So, uh, do, 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 get rid of structure. All right, so looks like we are gonna be deploying a namespace. That would make sense, right? And then we've got a couple CRDs here. We've got a hierarchy configuration CRD. Okay, we'll explore how that works. I could read the description to you, but let's just, uh, let's note that it's there. We've got an HNC configuration. Okay, interesting. So we'll have to check these two out. We've got a hierarchy configuration and then an HNC. Remember the C should stay, or sorry, sorry, Paul, hunk controller. Um, this is, uh, this is the HNC config. So that'll be interesting to check out how that works. Uh, another CRD sub namespace anchor. I read a little bit about the notion of anchoring, so we'll be able to dig into that. Um, and then we've got the typical roles. We've got cluster role. Okay. Anything else interesting? Cluster role, role binding, cluster role binding, cluster role binding service, all normal stuff. Here's a deployment. Okay, so this will be our HNC uh, our HNC controller manager. Um, the C stands for controller, right? So it's the HNC controller, the, the controller controller manager, maybe, or am I getting that wrong? <laughs> uh, HNC controller manager looks good. Starts up. Um, 
Ooh, it's got a web server port. So it maybe maybe HNC is also setting up a mutating or validating webhook of sorts. We'll have to check that out. So perhaps the controller, ah, here's, here's our answer. It looks like it's linking into a validating webhook config. So something on the API server level is gonna call out to HNC to do some type of validation. We'll see if we can figure out how that works today as well. And that's it. So the key things we've got here are like most controllers or operators, in this case, I, more of a controller, I suppose, we've got custom resources, we've got a deployment, and it looks like that uh, deployment doubles as both a controller and a webhook, a validating webhook as well. All right. And yes, Cube Builder, woo! So this thing's built on Cube Builder, pretty freaking cool. Uh, we love we love the Cube Builder project, and controller runtime is just becoming more and more pop uh, powerful with all of the stuff that the uh, operator framework has been bringing into Cube Builder and controller runtime. So that's that's really cool. Controller runtime all the way. Oh yeah, good stuff. All right, Mahmood, welcome. Thanks for saying hey. Welcome to TGIK. All right. All right, I'm psyched, everyone. Let's get this thing deployed and see if we can make it work. So we're going in, and we're going to get back to the, the folder I was in. Let's see if we can find that real quick. It looks like it's this thing right here. We'll get that. We'll CD over there, and we're back in business. I'll actually go out one directory because I want to look at some of the code, too, um, as we dive in. Okay, kubectl apply, and we will apply. As always, what the heck did I name the thing? HNC manager.yaml, which might have been what it was already called. HNC, oh, duh, Josh. HNC manager.yaml. And I'll tell you what, we'll also just open up a quick watch. Cube cuddle, get pods for the namespace. And the namespace was HNC system. So let's set up a watch there. HNC system. All right, it doesn't exist yet. That's expected. Let's apply and let's flip over. Okay, so we got an HNC controller manager being deployed. Looks like we got the container creating, good stuff. Uh, what version of Kubernetes am I using, Adrian? Great question. I think you might be in luck today because I think I am using 118. Let's see, get nodes. I'm using 118.6, so uh, <laughs> hopefully that will be the perfect version for what we're, what we're playing around with here. All right, good deal. Get, get Steve is a git oopser. I love it. All right. Uh, cool. So it's deployed. Pod seems to be up and running. Now, let's see what exactly we got going on. The first thing I usually like to do, I know we already checked it out in the YAML file, but let's go ahead and just check out the uh, CRDs we've got. Okay. So the new CRDs that I can see from here, we've got CRDs for... Hierarchy configuration seems pretty reasonable. We've got a CRD for the HNC configurations, which I think is the controller configuration. And then we've got those sub namespace anchors we talked about as well. So I think we've got our CRDs in place and I think we're pretty much ready to make a namespace now. I guess you know one thing we should talk about real quick um, that maybe maybe wasn't super obvious, but I'm sure I'm sure you all grok it. I'm just going to call it out. You saw me deploy stuff to Kubernetes, right? So one of the key things to note with this project is that it is what I would refer to as an out of tree project with core Kubernetes. So all the things we're about to do, don't expect yourself to go into a vanilla Kubernetes cluster tomorrow and start doing all these things. The project, and we had a bit of a Twitter convo about it. The project is something that is able to be deployed as, as we saw as a controller and a plugin. And over time, this is what's great about these kind of SIGs and, and what we can do with incubation. Over time, we can use this as something that's not in the core code base, but over time, based on usage, based on features, based on feedback, we can make a more informed decision as to whether it should exist in core Kubernetes. Now, I'm not implying it will or it won't. I'm just saying that we get to try these things out because you, you all probably felt this pain a bit with like the cloud provider integrations back in the day. Like it's a lot harder 
to rip something out of a core project than it is to add it in. So again, everything we're showing you here is something you can deploy on top of your cube, uh, Kubernetes cluster. Adrian can probably tell you in chat what the minimum version is, if it's like 116 or 117, but you should be able to deploy this on an existing cluster and try it out today without necessarily upgrading unless you're on a really old Kubernetes version. So let's see if we can figure this thing out, all right? So, and Adrian said they work back to 115. All right, good deal. So if you have a 115 plus, you should be able to deploy this thing. All right, so kubectl get HNS, uh, or sorry, not get HNS, kubectl HNS, make the text a little more readable here. We have commands of create, describe, help, set, and tree. Now, it looks like create is going to create a sub namespace under a given parent, which would make me believe that I probably need a parent namespace. So let's see if we can do this whole team A thing. And I'm going to start off with just a normal namespace. So kubectl, uh, kubectl, create namespace uh, team A. Okay. So we've got namespace team A created. And inside of here, what I'm actually kind of curious about, let's, let's bring up the logs of the controller down here just so we can watch what it's got going on. So kubectl, get pods for the namespace HNC system. Here's the HNC controller manager. Let's, let's watch the logs here and make sure. Kubectl logs, HNC controller for the namespace HNC system. And this has two containers in it, so let's specify the manager. Okay, so what do we got going on here? Um, updating HNC config for namespaces reconciled, count four. All right, so let's see actually then. So if we do a kubectl, before we make that sub namespace, if we do a kubectl get HNC configurations for all namespaces, uh, or sorry, this is a global object, right? Yeah, okay. So HNC configuration is config. Let's see what it's got inside of it right now. So we've got a config thing called HNC configuration. Okay, we'll go ahead and put this into, into Vim real quick. Okay, file type is YAML. Nope, I don't remember what my FT, I think it's set file type, isn't it? Set file type YAML, is that it? Nope, I can't remember. Okay, anyways, HNC configuration, spec, role binding. Okay, so, oh, this is good. Okay, cool, cool. So. It looks like the controllers got a setting on it. Again, this is the HNC controller config that is letting us choose which objects we're going to want to propagate based on the mode, propagate into our children uh, namespaces. So I'm guessing here. We'll see if that's actually what happens. But this looks like what this configuration is doing as far as I can tell. So. My expectation is once we create our child namespace, we should see a role binding propagate if we have any role bindings in it. And we should also see roles propagate if we've got any roles in it. Oh, there was an equal sign there, huh? Set file type equals YAML. Nice. Thanks, Waleed. That's it. All right. So cool, cool. And Adrian says you can also say kubectl HNS config describe. Let's try that out then. Because um, like we talked about with that plugin, we might not need to necessarily interact directly with the CRDs unless we really want to. So HNS config describe. Oh, this is beautiful. Fantastic. So we can see our synchronized types. We can see what's propagating. And now that we've looked at the CRD, we know what powers this under the hood. Good stuff. Yeah, this is pretty cool. All right. So what do you say we make a child namespace then? So uh, kubectl HNS, and we'll just uh, maximize this real quick. Kubectl HNS create, and I'm just going to see if it yells at me and gives me uh, a thing. HNS create, OK. Call out the parent namespace. This will be team A for us. And then child is going to be the name of our child. See if there's any global flags that are really important. Doesn't look like it. OK, so let's grab this. Okay, and let's go ahead and do that. Does kubectl explain HNS work? That's a good question, Duff. I would think not, because it's a plugin, right? 
I'll try it in a second though. I'm not sure. Um, okay. So kubectl hns create, our parent is team A, and our child is, like we talked about in our diagram, the team A data layer. Very, very important namespace. Okay, so let's create this. And we have successfully created the child. Let's look at the logs real quick and see. Oh no, Josh, what did you do? You killed your session. No, don't worry. I can save us. Have no fear, everybody. Okay, so it's the downside of having too many keyboard shortcuts. You hit the wrong key and something really bad happens. So kubectl get, uh, this will be get namespaces. Okay, here we go. So we have got the HNC namespace. We've got team A and we've got team A data. Now, I guess the important thing to note here is that the controller, right, is is doing a lot of things under the hood to make this notion of, of, um, of hierarchy exist. So at a Kubernetes level, what I'm trying to say is it's still flat. It's still the standard namespace structure. What I'm expecting is for this thing to be doing a heck of a lot of stuff for us to make this type of stuff possible. But again, at a per cube level, right? That's the thing. Okay. So, uh, so I mean CRDs uh, that are registered can be plumbed through explain. Um, oh, that's a great question, Duff. Yeah, sorry. I, when you said HNS, I thought you were talking about the plugin, not the CRD. So if we do kubectl get HNC configurations, let's try explain and see what pops up. Okay, nothing yet. But as Adrian said, we can put some issues in for this because describing how this thing works would be pretty freaking cool. Um, so yeah, I'm guessing it's just a matter of either some metadata that we need to put in via Cube Builder, or we got to go in and modify the, the CRD definition itself. But hopefully Cube Builder supports, uh, supports this description stuff for explain. I'm sure it does. Cool. All right, so Adrian said, check out cube cuddle HNS tree, which is probably going to show us that relationship. Let's see. There it is. Okay. So while Kubernetes shows us a flat namespace layout, obviously the plugin can determine what the actual relationship itself is. Now, I would think, Adrian, that you probably can make children of children. Um, and I wonder if there's a limit to that, but let's just, let's just test that theory super quick here. So if we did a quick, uh, now of course I've lost all my, uh, all of my good re uh, reverse. So kubectl hns create, there it is. Okay, and we're gonna do team a data. And we're gonna say team a data two, okay. And then we'll check out the tree again. Okay, so now we've got a tree. And I guess the, the, the trivia question of the day is how deep can we go? Which I probably won't try that out on this episode, but uh, that can be an exercise to the, to the reader. Adrian says, I think we've tested about 100. <laughs> so yeah, and that's a behavior they don't normally recommend. I think if you end up with a hierarchy that has a depth of 100 in your tree, you probably want to take a second look at what you're doing. <laughs> just a hunch, just a hunch. Um, and I would do that recursion, Paul. Uh, I would do that recursion bomb, Paul, if and only if I knew my cluster wouldn't blow up, which I'm a little bit worried about. <laughs> so I'm not going to mess with that. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So we've got this. Um, let's go ahead. Actually, let's delete a child. I want to keep it just one child deep for this initial thing. So. Uh, that's a good question. Do I just delete the namespace from a normal level or is there a delete command? Let's see here. So HNS config, create, describe, help, set tree. Okay, so I'm guessing I can just delete it. And actually, you know what? Here's This would be an interesting test, everyone. Well, let's, actually, let's just start by deleting that. So kubectl, get namespace, kubectl, delete namespace, team A, data two. Uh, forbidden. Oh, okay. We're already learning about how and why the validating webhook exists. So 
we've got two interaction points with uh, with hierarchical namespaces, right? And one of those interaction points that's not in cluster with the controller is, or sorry, which is not with the plugin is with just cube cuddle. So if we go in and start trying to screw with things that the hierarchical namespace has links into, it looks like the validating webhook is warning us. And it looks like it's got a pretty good message here. It's saying, please delete the anchor from the parent namespace to delete the sub namespace. So I'm guessing what this is saying, and Adrian, if there's an easier way to do this, shout out for us, but I'm guessing we need to remove the parent-child relationship, and then we need to go in as an extra step, perhaps, and delete the namespace outright. That's what I'm gathering from this error message, so let's see. So please delete the anchor from the parent, um, the parent namespace. Okay. Uh, cube cuddle delete sub namespace. Okay. Cube cuddle delete the sub namespace object. Okay, let's let's look at that actually real quick. So cube cuddle get sub namespace object. Okay, so I'm guessing sub namespace should exist in team A data, maybe. Uh, okay, so inside of team A data. There is a sub namespace object that is team a data two. All right, so let's let's look at that real quick. Um, so effectively, just to make sure we're all following here, because we're like three layers of inception deep at this point, right? We're looking inside of this namespace, and we're basically seeing an object that is a sub namespace object CRD, and that sub namespace object seems to have, I'm guessing, a pointer to team a data two, right? So our relationship in this case looks a little something like this, as far as I can tell. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, cube cuddle, get sub namespace, namespace looks good. We will delete that then. So if we delete the sub namespace, and that is named team a data two. Okay, so sub namespace deleted. Now it's it looks like it's blocking here. So I guess what Adrian was perhaps saying and what I'm observing is I betcha that once the ownership of the sub namespace is in place or the kind of the parent child, whenever you delete that sub namespace anchor, you are effectively releasing and thus I'm thinking deleting that lower level sub namespace. So to validate that theory, if we do cube cuddle, get namespace, there we go. So now we've got team A and team A data. And if we look at our tree one more time, we now have just team A and team A data. So a way to visualize this, right, is we deleted this thing right here, okay? And in deleting it, this link was broken and then something happened, I'm guessing from the controller to get rid of that. So that is the flow that it looks like we just did. Releasing and unlinking and deleting seem to be all part of, of the same thing. So in terms, uh, YMO says also in terms of resource limits, you can say to allocate CPU and RAM to one namespace. Um, we thought about hierarchical resource quota. Yeah, we should talk about that today because that is something that plagues my, my big uh, clients a lot. Um, the notion of having kind of this ability to set up a higher level, um, you know, CPU and memory, and then have sub namespaces kind of borrow from that, which is a bit more of an, a more advanced use case than just propagation of objects. So that is uh, that is a really really interesting thing. Um, and Ibram, you said quota management in hierarchy is inevitable. Yeah, I mean, it seems that way. Like it would be a huge win if we had mechanisms to do that because I, the the glue and sticks that I've seen put together in order to uh, in order to achieve that type of functionality is not usually the prettiest thing. Um, cool, cool. All right, let's do this thing. So uh, we've got the namespaces in place. We haven't synced objects though, right? So let's go ahead and do that next. If we go over to our manifest for just a moment, we have got 
Netpol role and role binding. So I'm going to start. I'm going to start at the RBAC level because remember we saw from the HNC config that we're currently looking at RBAC things like role bindings and roles. So the role binding I've got, I just pulled these before TGIK off the Kubernetes docs. What the content isn't as important as like the object itself propagating, right? So let's see if we can deploy role binding in the parent and if that will then sync down. So again, I think it would be helpful here to bring up the logs. Uh, for HNC manager, which clearly I've got an old name here. So let's see, kubectl, get pods, namespace, HNC system. Here's our controller manager. Let's go ahead and grab that. So kubectl logs, paste it in. We will do C for the manager container, not that proxy RBAC container. And let's make sure we know we're looking in the HNC system namespace. Okay, and let's follow it. Lovely, okay. So I'll bring this a little bit smaller so y'all can see a bit better. Um, it looks like we're at about uh, timestamp 1601, probably look at the end of the timestamp, so 147, okay. So if we go in and we do a cube cuddle apply of the object, manif oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong directory again, everyone. Give me just a second here. Uh, we'll do CD into TGIK episodes 133 HNC. There we go. Cube cuddle apply for the file role binding. Uh, did I have a role binding file? Oh, I keep forgetting I'm in manifest. Role binding. There it is. Unsupported version. Unsupported version config updater. Okay, Josh, you messed up your YAML. You had one job. You just had to copy and paste. How the heck did you mess that up? Okay, before I try to figure out where, I'm just gonna say role binding, Kubernetes, and see what's wrong here. Let's see, role binding, role binding. There's a role binding. Why solve the problem when you can just copy and paste it again? Um, so we will do that, we will paste it in and we've got a role binding called read pods. So back here, role binding, there we go. Okay, so we've created a role binding, um, role binding in queuing descendant objects. So if I were to guess, um, this is probably in queuing the work into like an object reconciler type thing. So it puts it in the queue. The reconciler should pick it up and bring it downstream into the other objects. Um, that seems okay. So let's see what we got here. If we go in and we do a cube cuddle, get namespace role. Oh, you know what I didn't do, everyone? I didn't point it at a namespace, did I? Let's check real quick. Ah, look at that. Default probably won't do us a whole lot of good. So I don't know what the object in queuing thing was. Maybe it enqueues all objects and then determines if it needs to do work on them to copy them. I don't really know what that log statement was, but let's, uh, you know what, just to keep this dynamic, let's take namespace out and we'll go back and do cube cuddle apply the manifest role binding. And we need to put this in team A because that's the one that does have that sub namespace. So namespace will be team A. Okay, that's a lot more stuff. What do we got going on here? Okay, uh, this might be a little tiny for y'all, but I'm just trying to see what's going on i do have a reconciliation error role binding ah interesting the role is not found which is cool because the role doesn't exist yet so that kind of makes sense but it's curious to me oh it's actually check this out it's coming from controller runtime I wonder if there's something in controller runtime that's checking for the role. Because, I mean, it is, it is misconfigured. I have a role binding without a role. But my question would be, should the controller care about that? Or shouldn't it just naively copy over the role binding regardless of whether the role's there? That's super interesting. Yeah. Oh, it's not from controller runtime. Okay, where, where is it coming from then, Adrian? Reconciliation error. Um, let's just, we'll test this out and we can always put the role in to fix it, but I'd be curious to know what exactly it's coming from. So kubectl get, uh, let's get role bindings real quick from the namespace team A. Okay, so read pods, the role binding, even though the read pod role is not there yet, 
we know that uh, we know that it's there. And I'm guessing in Team A data, it's not going to be there yet. Okay. So Adrian says that's just the default error returned to HNC to the framework. That error is coming from Kate's itself. If you create a role binding without a role by hand, I'd guess you'd get the same error. I don't think so because I just created a role binding by hand right here. I kind of I kind of wonder if it's got something to do with what um, controller runtime does when it like looks things up because it almost I'm not a controller runtime expert. But when I read this message, it looks like in the reconciliation project, it might actually be trying to look up the corresponding role, which is a little bit curious to me. Um, nonetheless, uh, let's go ahead and see if we can create a role. And who knows, maybe this will be an issue for controller runtime, or maybe I'm just misunderstanding controller runtime. So uh, let's go ahead and see if we can make a role. Now, the role probably needs to line up. So we know our role binding is read pods, it's got a role ref to pod reader. Okay, to pod reader. So I need to make sure that this is named pod reader. And ironically, this role has absolutely nothing to do with reading pods, but that's not the point, right? The point is that the object actually creates read pods, good, good. Roll looks good. Okay, I think this should be fine. And again, just ignore that our rules are kind of silly for this. So let's go back to the terminal here. All right. So we will try this again. Um, I've still got the role binding in place. So we'll do a cube cuddle get, or sorry, cube cuddle apply. And we will do this again to manifest. And this time we're gonna also apply the role.yaml that is created. Now let's watch kubectl get role binding and role for the namespace, uh, the namespace team A data. Okay, we've got nothing yet. Um, so I'm looking for role bindings and roles. Let's see if the controller tells us anything. So uh, make this just a bit smaller. Okay, so okay, it enqueued the descendant objects. So I don't think I've gotten the error again yet, but I don't know if we've seen the reconciler uh, execute, unless, I guess it depends, after it's in queued, uh, does it log anything about having done something, you know? That's what we'll have to check out. Still nothing. Do, do, do. Possible new source object. All right, let's give it a second here. And while we're doing that, let's look a little bit at the, uh, the project itself and see what we got going on. So I downloaded the, the source code before we, before we started today, and it looked like there's a couple reconcilers that we've got uh, firing off in here. I'm thinking, and I only looked at the names, I'm thinking the object reconciler is probably what we're waiting on if I don't have anything misconfigured. And my guess is that the object reconciler is probably what's gonna help us actually go in and propagate these objects to the sub namespaces. So object reconciler, reconciles generic objects. You must create one for each group kind. Okay, so I think what they're doing here, right, is rather than the object reconciler being specific to things like role bindings or namespaces and so on, it looks like it takes uh, things in generically, thus why it's called object. So the notion here is that we could bring in network policy. We could bring in you know, any arbitrary object, I would think, unless there's ones that we'd be limited to, Adrian. Um, and we could configure the HNC controller so that these objects could be picked up and then eventually have some type of synchronization happen um, when that needs to occur. So if we go back to our terminal, uh, not found stack trace, huh. nothing yet. Let's see what we got here. So if we do kubectl get, let's see, roll for the namespace. Um, oh, you know what I think we did, everyone? I think we might not have specified the namespace for roll. That sounds about right. So if I go back, let me just double check this real quick. If I go back here, I apply, yeah, that's exactly what I did. So that would make sense why we're not seeing any change. So let's go back to manifest and let's go back to our role. Yeah, check it out. So it probably went right into the default namespace. All right, let's do this again. So 
we will do this. We will apply it to the namespace um, team A. There we go. See if I can bring up logs again. Okay. Ah, this looks a lot better. We've got a newly propagated object. I don't think I was seeing that before. So that could be good. Let's see if I come back here and I look for roles in the namespace team A data. Check it out. We have a pod reader now. And I bet you if we check out for role binding here, we've probably got, assuming it's spelled right, bindings. We've now got that relationship in place for role and role bindings. Pretty cool. Um, so what do y'all think? That's, oh wait, actually, is role bindings in here? Or am I losing my mind? No resources in the team A data namespace. So, oh, that was role that came up again, wasn't it? So role seemed to sync. I wonder if we're in some type of weird state because the role binding didn't come through because of this error. So perhaps now the reconciler is not actually uh, trying to redo the role binding. Or um, when you write controllers in Kubernetes, there's this, uh, this parameter. I can never remember the name. It's like sync all or something like that where you can like requeue all the stuff and do, and do work on it again. It might not have triggered that quite yet. All right. So Adrian says, try kubectuddle HNS describe team A data. Ah, this is great. Okay, so we've got some additional stuff. Could not write roles because pod reader was not found. Okay, so one of the things it looks like we can do here is actually use that HNS plugin to more easily understand what conditions fired off on the namespace and, and what we've got going on here. Um, affected by this condition is team A read pods. So that's some pretty good output so we can kind of understand what's going on. Now, I'm thinking this condition is probably what is causing our failure to not see a role binding. So if I do a kubectuddle get role binding for the namespace team A data, still got nothing. Now check this out. If my, if my theory is right, if we go in here and we delete the role binding, so let's do this against the role binding for the namespace team A, just team A in this case. So let's delete that. Great, so that got deleted. That was the one that, again, might still not get requeued because there was some type of error. And let's go ahead and apply this now. So we've got that into team A. We've got role binding. YAML looks good. All right, so now the role binding was created. Let's see if we blow up in the logs. I'm not seeing it blow up in the logs. In fact, I am also seeing that newly propagated object message again. So there's a pretty good chance that it actually got copied over. Um, so get role bindings for name. Oh, actually, I had it right there. Team A data. There it is. All right. Awesome. What do you think, everyone? Seems to be working. So it seems like, and I don't know um, if this is configurable, Adrian, or if you know offhand, but I'm guessing if an object fails like on, from an upstream library, like uh, even if it's cube core, but let's say it's controller runtime, I wonder when the objects get requeued to potentially be reevaluated for whether they should be copied, you know? Or if it like has a, a circuit breaker or something where it's like backed off and we just had to wait longer, you know, what, what that stuff, what that behavior would be. But overall, we seem to be syncing up, no problem. All right, so we've got role bindings, we've got roles. Okay, it's all there. So I think the one other thing we should, we should check out here, everyone, let's try to bring in a new object that the HNC or hunk was not set up to synchronize by default, right? So um, network policy is what I had mentioned earlier. I think we're gonna roll with network policy. Uh, network policy, this is a really common one, right? Where you know maybe in your organization, you do like a, a deny all style uh, flow where by default, you basically deny all traffic across all namespaces and so on. Now, perhaps you want to use this HNC model to make sure the rules that need to be there for, uh, for the child namespaces have the deny all set up in place, which by default with most CNI plugins, how this works is 
if you have no network policy in place at all, everything's open to the world. <laughs> the second you apply a network policy, that behavior sort of inverts in that only things you explicitly allow in your network policy now receive and send traffic. Everything else becomes blocked by default. So that's kind of one of the key things. Or maybe, again, there's just a set of default network rules. Like you want to make sure everyone can egress to DNS. You want to make sure folks can receive traffic on port 80 and 443. But if they need to go in and, and you know, uh, set up you know, access to 8443, that's an extra step that folks need to go through and, and be able to put together. So that's a great example of where this network policy thing can, uh, can work pretty well. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, try to set this up then. So we know network policy by default shouldn't work, I think. So if we did a quick, let's see, if we did a quick cube cuddle apply of network policy, so we'll do this in the manifest network policy, and we will do this in namespace team A again. Okay, so network policy got added to team A. And if we come over and get uh, netpol from the namespace team A, it's there. But in team data, it's not there, which is exactly what I would expect based on what we saw about that configuration and also what Adrian had mentioned in chat, this idea that um, by default, we're just grabbing role bindings and roles. So... The thought process, I would think, is we can modify that CRD. There might even be a way to do it in the controller, but let's just let's look at the CRD one more time. So we'll do kubectl get HNC configurations, um, and I think it was just called config, right? In fact, I'll do what we probably should never do. Uh, I'll edit it, and we'll come in here for HNC, and we know that this has the role uh, in mode that you can put in here, right? So we've got role binding and then the mode. So let's go ahead and set this up real fast. Um, we'll just do a quick copy. We'll paste this in. All right, now the API version that I'm going with, I know that my API version is uh, networks, networking Kates. So let's grab that API version, paste that in. Okay, and then our kind is of course network policy. Now, what's interesting is there's also this idea of different modes. So what we could likely do, um, and this might be one of those things that we could either describe or explain when it gets added, but let's, let's look, since we have the code base here, let's look at the API. API v1 alpha 2 hnc config. Yep. And inside of here, We've got, ah, it's right in front of us, synchronization mode. So we've got propagate, which is going to propagate ancestors to descendants and delete obsolete descendants. Okay, that's probably what we're going to want 99% of the time. Ignore looks like it's a no-op. It literally does nothing. And then remove would remove all propagated copies. Interesting. Oh, I'm using V1 alpha 1. Well, let me know if uh, let me know if these things are different, but it looks like based on your uh, your chat message, they're the same. <laughs> so we've got propagate, we've got ignore, we've got remove. Um, cool, that all makes sense. All right, they're lowercase constants now. Okay, big change, uh, but at least the functionality is the same. Good deal. All right, so let's go ahead and keep this as propagate. That seems to make sense. Now here's what'll be interesting, everyone. We're gonna apply this, and what do you think will happen? Will the controller suddenly realize that it now cares about network policy and pick up the existing network policy objects and propagate them down to the children? Or will this only be occurring on net new network policies that we create? What do you think? Let's try it out. So I'll save that in. Again, I'm, I'm being a bad Kubernetes administrator here and running kubectl edit. Uh, okay, so that went in place. Now, like we talked about, this could be like a bit of a timed thing. Like this could be something where um, we don't see network policy propagate immediately because the controller runtime is waiting for some amount of time to do, and I think it actually might be called resync, a resync of all the objects. We'll see. So Mona, you think it won't, um, that didn't happen with role bindings. Great point. Now, the one delta here though, right, is that role bindings hit an error. 
So I wonder if there's going to be any delta in uh, in that. But that's that's a great guess. Let's let's check it out. So we'll go to watch, and we might have just seen it there. Let's go to Cube Cuddle, get Netpal. All right. Uh, and Adrian said, if it's not, it's a bug. Okay, well, good news is I don't think there's a bug because network policy is officially propagating down to this. Pretty cool stuff. All right, this is awesome. This is some of the key stuff that I really wanted to test out with y'all. Um, here's, here's actually something that's interesting. Um, and I saw a blog post about this somewhere, and I didn't, I unfortunately didn't read it a ton, but I'm, I'm kind of curious if this will get us in trouble or if this will work well. One, one last little science experiment, I think, could be really interesting to check out. So now we know that we can set up a relationship of, I guess I'll call it a parent namespace, and then we've got this way to link that via this idea of a sub namespace. Let's let's make sure this is like a different border so it's super clear what we're calling out here. Um let's let's do this real quick. Okay, cool. So this is the sub namespace. Now, um here's actually a question for you Adrian. This idea of a sub namespace, the the actual resource, is this is this what the anchor is? Is it the same concept here, right? So team A should have a sub namespace that points to team uh, team A data in this case. So let's just let's just verify that real quick. So we do cube cuddle, we do get, we get sub oh it's sub namespace anchor. It's right there. Sub namespace anchor for the namespace um, team A. So team A has a sub namespace anchor to team A data. Okay. Now, if we go back here, um, the, the idea that I'm kind of interested in testing out with y'all is what if we had team B, and you know this probably isn't something we do too commonly, but I'm just mostly curious about how it would work. Um, so if we did team B, and we wanted to move team A underneath team B, what would happen here? right? I'm curious on so many levels. Like what if, what if team B had a sub namespace that pointed to team A data, but team A already had a sub namespace that I, I would think is, is sort of giving ownership to it, right? Um, and also if we just legitimately wanted to cut ties with team A for some weird reason and get rid of this relationship, could we do that? And would all the objects like reconcile and depropagate and repropagate accordingly? So that would be a really interesting test. Uh, Chaco, you said delete the synced resource. Oh, good point. We should definitely delete the synced resource. That's a great, that's a great idea. Um, so I come in because I have more access than I, than, I, uh, than I had before or should maybe have. So we do get, uh, get network policy, right, on the namespace team A data. All right, we know that that's there. So let's run that again in a watch format up here. So we'll do watch. Boom. All right, now what happens if we delete this thing? How quick will this work? Because again, the parent, I would think, should still be able to come into play and be like, no, the, the network policy is there. And, and frankly, I probably shouldn't even have access to delete this network policy, but let's assume I do for, for just science. Uh, cube cuddle, delete. Okay, we'll delete the network policy. And we'll delete API allow in the namespace uh, uh, namespace team A data in this case. This is the, the child. Ah, our, our friendly admission webhook has come in to, to help us out here. So admission webhook is saying, you can't delete this thing, right? It was propagated from team A. So this is actually a pretty good experience. Rather than having like some weird async thing where it like, maybe deletes it and then there's a gap in the security for a second when it reconciles or maybe it does successfully delete it and like something weird happens and you just never detect it, you'll get that instant feedback. So you can see where sometimes having that kind of validation step where it actually is in the critical path of the API server can give you a pretty good user experience because a lot of times when we rely uh, you know, exclusively on reconciliation behind the scenes, we do something and we don't know all the implications and things that have happened based on something we shouldn't have done, if that makes sense. So this is a pretty cool, pretty cool user experience from the validating webhook. Okay.
So there's your answer, Chaco. Uh, we aren't allowed to delete it. But of course we can delete it from the parent, right? I would think that should be allowed, assuming we have access. So if we delete, uh, if we delete the network policy, uh, API allow, API allow from the parent, which is team A, there we go. In the top buffer here that I have, the team A data namespace, network policy got ripped out of team A. So it also got, uh, what should I call it? Depropagated, unpropagated? Maybe I should just call it deleted. It got deleted from the team A data namespace, just like that. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so let's see if we can cut ties and chat. If there's if there's anything else you want to try out or ideas, uh, things you want to see, feel free to give me some ideas if you got it. Yeah, it's been it's been hunked. I like that. All right, let's try this last thing. Unless any more ideas come out of chat for things to test, uh, to cut ties with Team A, Cube Cuddle, Edit Namespace, Team A Data. Oh, and remove sub name. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, this will be an interesting avenue for us to check out. So, let's go ahead and look at namespace team a data here and adrian is saying we should have an annotation i'm guessing is this an annotation uh annotation no sub namespace of he said so there oh it is an annotation there it is sub namespace of team a interesting okay so now what do we know now we know that a sub namespace exists. Okay. And I'm just bringing it back here. We know that at least at least in our current state, there might be different flows that exist here, but let's just assume a sub namespace exists. And then a ref as well gets put in the annotation of the namespace. Right? Let's make this just a little bit bigger. My diagramming foo is getting uh getting bad. You can tell it's Friday. Uh that says sub of, right, in an annotation, and this will say team A essentially. So we've got these two kind of links. Now, I think what Adrian is saying here is that we can go in and change this annotation, and then some amount of reconciliation will happen to put us under team B. Now, I wanna make this experiment a little bit more chaotic. Let's change this to something that doesn't exist. So let's say that we want to be a sub namespace of team Z and see what that does. Um, so we'll go off the rails a little bit here. Here's the logs of the controller. We'll see if we, uh, if we get anything interesting here. So boom, boom, edited. Okay, now in my uh, massively sized text, is there anything that works here or, or gives us any clues here? Let's go to the top. Reconciling trigger team A, team A data, message sub namespace, annotation of namespace does not match its parent. Updating, okay, instance on namespace server, overwriting parent to team Z. So it looks like it overwrote it there, right? Um, hierarchy, missing parent. Okay, check it out. So we can see here that there is a catch that the parent is in fact missing. You can see that it wrote the condition in. So like Adrian had told us before, if we do a cube cuddle, um, what was it? It was describe or something, right? There it is. Yeah, team A data. We can see the conditions that came in here. We can see critical parent missing, missing parent, sub namespace anchor missing. The anchor is missing in the parent namespace. So what happened then? Uh, if we go in and we do cube cuddle get namespace, team A data is still there. If we edit it one more time. Ah, okay. So what are the implications of this? I'm guessing that maybe it's just floating around with no relationships anymore. Is that fair to say, Adrian? So cube cuddle get role binding for the namespace team A data. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. So it's kind of in the abyss of like, I'm not related to anybody. I'm a, I'm a wandering namespace that's on my own now. And of course we don't go in and just start ripping stuff out of the namespace because it lacks ownership. Um, so, ah, and, and specifically Adrian saying the reason it won't delete anything um, is because it has a critical condition in place. Um, Got it, got it. Which I'm guessing HNC, when you say just hands off, it means that it's like a 
not only does it do no op, it doesn't do anything. It's like, I don't own you anymore. I don't, I don't have any involvement with you. Now, let's see if we can fix this, right? So team Z obviously didn't work, but if we go ahead and say cube cuddle create namespace team B, okay? And again, this is the idea that in here, we're gonna try to bring team A, I guess now team A looks like this, right? So I think team A, it still has the annotation here of team Z. And I'm expecting by changing this annotation to B, we can link it up and actually see something from B propagate into team A. So let's, let's do something to make this super concrete. We've got cube cuddle, get namespace here. We've got team B. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and make a specific network policy that we're gonna just call team B, the best policy. All right, we'll save that up. And we're gonna go ahead and apply the, to the namespace team B. We're going to apply the, um, uh, what's it called, what's it called? The uh, netpol, yep. Netpol for netpol.yaml, okay, which is in, unfortunately I have to put the full path here, TGIK episodes 133 HNC manifests, network policy YAML. And this will go into team B. I think that looks okay. Uh, oops, F would be helpful, huh? Uh, Netpol F. Okay, unexpected args, apply. Oh, it's a file. What am I doing? Network policy. There we go. Lovely. Okay, network policy is created. So just as a sanity check, cube cuddle, get netpol for the namespace team B. Looking good. All right. So. This, uh, this test that we're doing, and as Adrian put, is not the best way to move the namespace. So, you know, just know that this is an experiment, <laughs> is hopefully going to be moved under ownership of Team B, and then we're going to be able to see those objects propagate. Again, just to kind of bring to light how these relationships are set up. So let's do exactly that. In the edit window up here, um, we will go to Team B. All right, and my hope, let's, let's maybe set up a watch before we, uh, before we get too crazy here. So if I do watch, cube cuddle, get netpol for namespace team A data, I'm expecting to see, and actually I'm gonna do two watches here, everyone. Check this out. We're gonna watch for netpol, and then what's, here's, here's what's really interesting. We're also gonna watch for the role binding. So what do you think's gonna happen here? Because keep this in mind, right? The role binding came from A, but we're moving ownership over to B. And remember that the current state that this namespace is in is it is detached from any parent. So my guess is, I think, that the role binding still won't be touched, but we will see the network policy get touched. What do you all think? That's my, that's my guess here. I think Policy comes in from network policy perspective, and then perhaps role binding won't even get touched. Let's see what happens. All right, we're submitting ourselves into team B. We're saving it up. We're going back to the watch. Oh, it did delete. It did delete the role binding. I was wrong. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Now, if I had theoretically, Adrian, created the role binding by hand in the team A data namespace, so it never came from a parent in the first place, would it have stayed in here or would it have gotten removed? That's pretty cool though. Yeah, that's really awesome. It would have stayed, okay, cool. So it knew that that thing came from HNC at one point and was propagated down and now it's being ripped out. And I don't know if that's if you got an annotation on the object or what the deal is. I guess I could check pretty easily. If I do cube cuddle get network policy for uh, team uh, for namespace team a data network policy, and we'll just oh yaml that into vim. And thanks to Walid, I know it's uh, set file type equals yaml. Lovely. Okay, annotations, creation time. Ah, there it is, labels. So I wonder if uh, I wonder if that label is what it's using to 
to figure out kind of that it came from HNC effectively. You know what I mean? So, huh. All right, pretty cool. Now, Yusuf, you said, let's try removing sync resources by removing policy from the, ah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, let's, let's try that as a little last experiment real quick. So if we do, what's so cool about this thing is like, there's so many implications of like, if I turn this knob, since it's responsible for all these other things, what will that impact be? Will it be a no op? Will it change something, right? So let's see, uh, let's see what we can do here. So cube cuddle, edit, HNC config, uh, config, great. Okay, HNC config. And I think what you were saying, Yusuf, is uh, to pop these out maybe, I'm thinking. Let's see. So if we pull network policy out of here all of a sudden, now that HNC doesn't care about network policy anymore, will it delete that network policy? So we'll do kubectl get uh, network policy for the namespace team A data, and it does not touch it. So it appears, if my theory is right and that this experiment is right, that removing something from the HNC controller is saying, as Adrian put it, hands off. It's not saying rip it all out, right? It's in, oh, it's in ignore mode now. Okay, so just like we saw before, right? Um, this is now in ignore mode, more or less, where it is, and it probably says something about it being the default, I bet, if we read closely, default, maybe. Um, nonetheless, it's in ignore mode now, and that is a hands-off type or, or don't change anything. And this includes not deleting it as well. So pretty freaking cool. Cues can be propagated for different namespaces. Awesome. Yeah, so let's, you know, one thing we had mentioned, well, I promise we'll wrap up on this today. One thing we had mentioned was obviously this idea of, of resource quotas. Now, I'm going to have Adrian spot check me here um, just to make sure I don't say anything horribly wrong. But the last concept I want to kind of talk about that I think is, is pretty interesting is it seems like today, please let me know if I'm off here, that HNC does a pretty cool job of doing object propagation, setting up the relationships, propagating objects. We've messed with a bunch of knobs. We've added new objects. We've moved stuff around, all that good stuff. Now, what's interesting about something like resource quota is that very commonly, and I'm going to keep it simple and not talk about things like limit ranges and stuff here. We're just going to talk about resource quota. Resource quota. Um, now, there's there's notions in Kubernetes of these things called limits and requests. They have different implications at the runtime or scheduler level. So let's just abstract that too and keep it super simple here. With something like resource quota, we can say, this isn't perfectly correct, but we can say things like, give this namespace the ability to request 10, uh, 10 or give this... Uh, yeah, give this namespace, right, it's cumulative. Yeah, it's cumulative. Give this namespace the ability to request this amount of, uh, of CPU. So we've got CPU 10 vCPU. We can also say something like memory, right? We've got the ability to say, okay, well, you've got you know 10 gigabytes of memory. And, and cube, it's denoted differently, but this is an easy way to conceptualize it. Now, I would think today what we can do, which is nice, is based on what we learned about object propagation, we can totally create another namespace and have things like resource quota propagate. But I would think, and this is where I need your help, Adrian, to say you're right or you're totally freaking wrong, is the propagation would likely just replicate the exact quota. So it would get duplicated, um, which might be fine. That might be exactly what you want. Like in team A, you could set a default for resource quota. And then, boom, when team, uh, when team A1 gets created, it'll just get replicated. Now, this solves a defaulting problem, but there's a common problem that folks who run large-scale cube clusters, especially multi-tenant ones, run into, where they have this notion of, like, I want to allocate a higher-level quota to something like team A. And then I want the sub namespaces that come off of that to be borrowing from that higher level quota. The notion being, perhaps in this quota, we say something like, you can have two virtual CPUs 
in five gigabytes of memory, right? Now, at this point, we've only got eight virtual CPUs and five gigabytes of memory left. So when we come in here, and in theory, especially when we're like self-servicing namespaces to teams and they're creating their own namespace, now when, they, when, the namespace, when team A comes in here and creates uh, team A2, we don't want them to be able to ask for you know, seven gigabytes of memory again. Because while there's enough CPU to create this namespace, there's not enough memory in what we allocated for team B. And this is one of those problems that gets solved in a variety of ways, some kind of sort of elegant, and many very, very ugly, but they eventually work, um, where you've got this concept of, of propagation coming down, right? So this is what will be super interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, really curious to see uh, Adrian and team, how you all uh, how you all come up with this over time. And, and it looks like Adrian said, would love help implementing. So if you're interested and passionate about patient, this could be a really good opportunity to kind of get involved, voice your experience and really, really interesting, really, really interesting thing. And if my memory calculation there is not something you could put in a YAML file and apply because I'm not using correct units. You're, you're totally right. Um, does C groups to solve this? So Martin, I'm not extremely familiar with the C groups two implementation. I gotta read up on it a bit. You know, I think the I think the key thing is that on the C groups level, this is that's gonna be something that gets more enforced at um, at runtime, right? So like when you set up a um, when you set up something like a, a CPU limit in in Kubernetes, it's going to at the host level use C groups to define how to throttle you back if you hit your max that you set to a limit, right? Um, and that is, in short, far more of a runtime concern, where this is a lot more of, not like on a host level or runtime concern, this is a lot more on a, how do we provision and allocate the ability to request that runtime resource? Does that make sense? So it's kind of more like a higher level kind of like provisioning standpoint, not so much at like a, a lower level thing, but yeah. So hope that helps. All right, all, this was a freaking awesome session. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope you learned something about hierarchical namespaces. If you're still in chat, be sure to give Adrian a thank you for sticking around and, uh, and, uh, and helping us out through all this good stuff and great job with the HNC controller. This was all things considered, pretty freaking smooth to just play around with without much exposure to it. So really, really cool. Hope you all had a great time and be sure to enjoy your weekend. I hope you get a, get a good time away from the, the computer a little bit if, if you so desire. So thanks again, everyone. We'll see you next time.